Well, good evening. I'm uh, Clifford Samuels, Jr. I'm currently the Vice President of Technology Automation. And TAC, as we call it, responsible for doing more of the technical events for the organization. Like we uh, sponsor our seminars and workshops for our members. Mm -hmm. And also we go out in the community and help bridge the digital divide in the community. In the past, we've set up computer labs. And uh, we also help out with the high school computer competition. So there's a lot of things uh, on the horizon soon. Once we get the membership a little more engaged, we have to get more in the community, do a little more coding and robotics. So stay tuned. So tonight we're going to talk about the Internet of Things. And this is the latest, greatest hot trend of devices and software currently. It is growing, you know, leaps and bounds. Leaps and bounds. There's a lot of products from the consumer side and the commercial side that are considered the Internet of Things. <clears throat> so tonight we'll give you a, a definition of Internet of Things. So just a brief overview of some of the products that are out there because it, it changes daily. Uh, the hardware platforms that are being used for the Internet of Things, the type of software that's being used, and kind of if you're an IT pro or someone who wants to get involved in the Internet of Things, kind of an ang angle that you can look at how you can uh, get yourself some extra cash in this uh, growing market. And the definition. There's a lot of definitions out there. A lot of the basic definition people are saying is, well, Internet of Things is just a device that connects to the Internet. Uh, that's true. But really, if you expand it to truly what it is, the Internet of Things is basically sensors, data, networks, and services equals the Internet of Things. And just below is telling you just a lot of the different other terminology used for the Internet of Things. Talk about you have the physical internet, ubiquitous computing, machine-to-machine uh, -machine interfaces, the web of things, connected environments, smart cities. So this is, a, it is very pervasive what the Internet of Things means. That basically when you create an Internet of Things device, it's usually going to have some sort of sensor. Let's take the thermostat that everyone's heard about, the Nest thermostat that's used in a home. So that's a sensor. It collects the data on the temperature inside your home and a composite for you to use to uh, better control your environment. And currently that device is not on the network. And that's really one of the problems with the Internet of Things currently. There's a lot of these devices, but they only go to the cloud. So they'll send data to the cloud, but they talk to nothing else. But that is changing now. And in services, well, that's definitely the side of the commercial aspect of it that you've heard of the Apple Watch and all these other devices. They're, they're trying to dream of, okay, now we have this device on you. What other services can we sell to the consumer? And also, I do have a video that actually explains a little bit more of the internet things from IBM's point of view, so let me call that up and let that play. So this is kind of IBM's perspective on the Internet of Things, which, of course, they're involved because of a lot of this software that they're uh, designing to communicate and databases that are available. And you've heard of that, uh, what was that, uh, on Jeopardy? Oh, God, I'm drawing a blank on that computer that beat all the humans. But they also <laughs> want to use that <laughs> in the Internet of Things. So let me bring up this video. and. century, but accelerating over the past couple of decades, the, the emergence of a kind of global data field. The planet itself, natural systems, human systems, uh, physical objects, have always generated an enormous amount of data, but we didn't used to be able to hear it, to see it, to capture it. Now we can, because all of this stuff is now instrumented. 
and it's all interconnected, so we can have, actually have access to it. So, in effect, the planet has grown a central nervous system. So there's about a billion people using the internet at the moment, and that's set to grow to probably two billion in the next couple of years. And we, we think that's quite a lot, but over the last 10 years I've been looking at devices being linked up together using networks, so little sensors on things, you know, these temperature sensors and traffic sensors and flow rate of water and how much electricity or transmitting data. It, it won't be long, it may even have happened already that there's more things on the internet than there are people on the internet. That's really what we mean by the internet of things. And you get this sea of data that you just drown in literally. And there's this triangle that's been quite well documented called the DIKW triangle. That's data, information, knowledge, and the tip of the top is wisdom. The D at the bottom is a sea of data, and when we get this data back home and start doing stuff with it, we apply intelligence to it and transform up that stack. So we go from data into information, information into knowledge, and then it gleans some wisdom from that. And that's really what it's what the analytics part of our Smarter Planet story is all about. But the, the ideal day, I guess, would be that um, I, I wake up in the morning and my alarm clock went up at the right time because it had looked in my diary to know when my first meeting was and had backtracked which ferry I need to get and therefore which, what time I need to get up. The bathroom heater would have been on for half an hour before that time to, uh, to, to make the bathroom nice and warm. And I'd know that the temperature had been freezing overnight and therefore that my ice was going to need to be scraped off my car so I need to leave the house five minutes earlier. And then I'd be getting a notification, perhaps an audio uh, announcement in my car as I drive to the ferry saying, well the ferries are running five minutes late so you know, no need to rush, just take your time. All that stuff is being handled by autonomic systems of little agents looking out on my behalf for the things it knows I want to do, you know, just making me aware of what's going on so that I can plan my day accordingly. So the system of systems is really what emerges when you start to link these things up. So the fact you've got isolated systems, for example, my house on its own, uh, with its energy monitoring and the water monitoring and the detecting if the windows and doors are open, that kind of stuff. It's a system, certainly, but it's not a system of systems. Um, but if you start to think about the, the power grid, first of all, the appliances negotiate with each other. So they say, okay, guys, Andy wants all three of us to operate, but it's gonna be bad for the grid if we all go on at the same time. So now suddenly we've got systems talking to each other, sort of acting smarter because they know about each other, which overall makes the entire system more efficient. There are more human beings living in cities now as of last year than ever before in human history, and that doesn't look like a trend that's reversing. Now, for every four text messages that a pedestrian sends while walking down the sidewalk, um, the sidewalk she's on is, is sending an equivalent amount of data. There are sensors all over the place, um, certainly in the water main. Um, they're registering blockages or not right beneath your feet. Taxis are, you know, um, broadcasting their position and, and fare status back to dispatch. Trains and buses are updating their locations in real time, which people are reading on that street corner. A matrixing of services creates a more resilient thing. And you know, we can let a water main blockage speak to the road signals above it and do something quickly before police can get there. Soon enough, uh, you know, we will just expect to be told exactly when the bus will arrive. You know, look at that complex set of relationships among all these complex systems. If we can actually begin to see the patterns in the data, then we have a much better chance of actually getting our arms around this. That's where societies become more efficient, that's where more innovation is sparked. When we talk about a smarter planet, you could say that it has two dimensions. One is to be more efficient, be less destructive, connect different aspects of life which do affect each other, in more conscious and deliberate and intelligent ways. But the other is also to generate fundamentally new insights, new activity, new forms of social relations. So you could look at the planet as an information creation and transmission system. And the universe was hearing its information, but we weren't. But increasingly now we can. Early days, baby steps days, we can actually begin to hear the planet talking to us. So, Sinefrida gave you a nice overview of what's happening in 
It was definitely talking about smart cities. Detroit is working towards that right now with buses. There's a system that was written that you can use SMS text, and if you text at your location, it'll give you approximate location where the bus is going to return. But see, that's just interesting. Really, what you want is a graph data that tells you exactly like uh, Uber. If you've heard of Uber, that taxi service, basically they're tied into GPS, so you know when your car is going to get there. Mm -hmm. And basically, that's more of the Internet of Things right there. Mm -hmm. And next, we're going to talk about just some of the products briefly. One is waste management. I've seen these up in Ann Arbor. These are what uh, systems uh, for recycling, and they're connected to the Internet. Mm -hmm. So basically, in, uh, inform the waste company when to come there, remove the garbage, or how much of a collection of recyclables have happened. Mm -hmm. So that's here today. And of course, like we talked about earlier, the connected thermometers, that's here today, Nest Systems and a few others. But they're going to get more advanced. Like Nest currently doesn't talk to your refrigerator or doesn't talk to your other devices. But that, that is uh, changing rapidly. Smart parking system, that's also another system that's in a lot of cities like uh, on the coast, especially California and New York, where you can literally you call up an app and say, where's a free parking space? And it tells you. Detroit will get that once they are fixed meters, because <laughs> you need smart meters for that to know, to be able to sense when someone's in a space. Connected cars, now that's the biggie. That you've heard of, the Google self-driving cars. But that's, that's more of the distant phase. Currently, you have connected cars with GM offering internet access in your cars through the cellular network. So now, your car is connected to the internet. And because of that, you get, if you do your normal internet browsing, but what's also possible, which uh, Tesla is doing with their cars, very expensive, uh, their 100K car, they can reflash the memory on this car, meaning we need to upgrade something. Oh, well, the whole car is software driven, just send a, a new upgrade to the car. And they've done that already, which they uh, increased the efficiency. They said, okay, we have a little uh, fix that uh, extend your battery range. So now if the car being connected, it shoots it directly in. You don't even go to your dealership. It just tells you, do you want to upgrade your car? It's kind of like Windows. We hope it doesn't like windows. We don't want blue screens in our car. No blue screens in there. That would be scary, especially with connected cars, too, when your Google car goes, oops, I'm sorry, the update failed. But we'll, hopefully we'll work that out. Uh, smartphones, of course, you have one. Everyone has that. And with all the sensors built in your smartphone, there are more and more apps that are going to come out and available but makes it more convenient for you to use your smartphone and to connect to other uh, Internet of Things devices. Uh, one uh, meeting I attended was talking about for a building, like the Capitol building, they say it's fully integrated to the Internet that for its building maintenance system. So basically, the engineer can be at home, call up the app on his phone, and change whatever he needs in the building. So if it gets an alarm, it's, oh, too hot in this room. Well, no one's in there. Cut it off. You turn off the lights, change all any parameter of the building's operations available mobily to this engineer. Now, fortunate that uh, uh, eliminates jobs because what may have taken three or four people or more to do this, one person can do it because it's all available on his phone or his uh, home computer. Wearable computing, you've uh, seen the Google Glass. Everyone thought that's dead. It's not dead. Microsoft. I mean, uh, Google just tested it. People didn't like it, but corporate America sees an advantage to Google Glass. That uh, I've heard that uh, construction sites are looking at how to use the Google Glass in the construction environment. So that's a tool that the consumer side may not be there, but on the commercial side, there are definitely commercial apps coming out for wearable computing. Yeah, I think Microsoft probably is going to borrow a little bit from Google. With oh, oh, yes. oh, yes. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. And Microsoft, which I'll get to later, has actually took a big step uh, forward into the Internet of Things. Asset tracking. This is for your farms. You realize today, these giant combines, you don't have to drive them anymore. People aren't in there. They don't have to be present in there. Take a set the GPS, and it will do the whole farmland. 
with no driver. Basically, the driver's just there just in case something does go wrong. And it gives the farmer a way to track the big assets and also with Internet Things. Now you can plant sensors all over your field and basically target your fertilizer. So it can now go, okay, this plot doesn't need fertilizer, so don't hit it. This plot needs a little bit more. This plot, uh, add a little more of your uh, fertilizer here to help this crop. So now they can actually, instead of just dumping a ton of fertilizer, which is bad for the environment in the runoff, now they can target exact areas so it's less waste and it helps the efficiency of farming. And machine vision, there was just a, uh, DARPA just had a uh, big contest on robots and a lot of robots are machine vision and trying to distinguish, you know, obstacles and how to open a door and how to walk. We're still at the end of the stage on a lot of that. For machine vision, currently the uh, auto has used it for, uh, in the assembly lines for auto assembly of devices. I know when I was at uh, Mazda plant, we had what we call engine decking and had camera systems. So basically, it would have the front half, front engine, and the rear suspension. It would automatically find the car body, put it in, bolt it in, all automatic, you didn't have to touch it, unless there were some other issues. <laughs> if the body was a little bit off, at that stage, that was an early development, so it had it problems if the body was slightly off, it didn't know how to adjust. Today, more than likely, they've solved a lot of those issues. So it's definitely going to hit the automation field, big. And like I said, this is just a small smattering of what's out there. You've heard of the wearables, your Apple Watch, and your Fitbits, Microsoft has one too. So that's the, just to start, because the medical field's looking into that also, using uh, these, those uh, Internet of Things connectivity. For, uh, which one I was gonna think of? Oh, for heart monitoring. Say you, you, you uh, a cardiac patient. It usually they just keep you in the hospital all the time, but now they can just remotely connect these sensors and devices to you and then it talks across your internet and lets them know what's going on. So in the medical field, this is definitely, the internet thing is gonna grow by leaps and bounds. Here are just some of the uh, big players right now in the internet of things. Cisco, they call, there's the internet of everything. IBM, the video we just saw, they call it the Smarter Planet. Uh, GE, Bosch, which is the automotive, uh, provider. The emerging players, you've heard of Nest and their uh, thermostats. There's a company called Ninja Blocks. They're coming up with these sensor blocks you can put together to sense your environment and send information to a database. Uh, Electric Imp is a connectivity service. Uh, that's more for electricity and monitoring your home. DTE right now, if you live in Detroit or, in the, or serviced by the uh, DTE, you may have gotten a notice where they talk about they want to change your electric meter. And basically they're installing smart meters, which is an Internet of Things device. It's going to talk across the uh, network and have control over your home electricity needs. And if you're, uh, say, your refrigerator, AC unit, furnace, if those are also connected with the, uh, into, the, uh, into their system, it can have control over it. So say uh, we have a 120 degree day and, and uh, Edison go, oh, we can't really handle the strength. So they can literally tell your house, okay, cut your AC up, cut. So it literally could cut everyone's back before an electrical problem can happen. Mm. So, <laughs> they pay the bill? Uh, no, they'll bill you better. <laughs> wow. Yeah, so, it, so definitely, uh, the internet things is already invaded utilities because they're seeing that as an advantage for them because if they can control the uh, electrical grid properly, they can prevent you know br brownouts and uh, blackouts. And also, again, it allows them to also shift energy, saying, okay, we have this factory who pays a better, you know, higher rate. We can now decrease the consumer side without harming them and shift that power to them, making more money. So it's, it's a profit thing in there also. Also on the crowdfunding side, this has been the 
I would guess the other big invention of the, of the internet age is crowdfunding. You've heard a lot of entrepreneurs and companies, individuals going out there using these crowdfunding sites. The famous one is Creflo Dollar, who went out <laughs> and asked for $65 million for his uh, private jet plane. And right here, this just this, this a list of a few of the companies are smart light bulb, home automation, uh, connected sensor, air quality sensor. That's a biggie, and especially like in areas in, uh, with high pollution, like we have in uh, zip code 48217 over near the uh, Marathon uh, uh, refinery. So that's definitely technology they would like to get more into because they would like to monitor the air quality and have that data available so they can go to city council and say, hold it, you're telling us that the air is clean, no, we have this data here. So it, it gives the consumer some power too, instead of you relying on, well, we gotta wait for the EPA to do their stuff and get their data and do this. Now you're able to enter the things, to either buy a device or build it yourself. And voice control, of course, you know, that, that came from Apple's Siri, so that's going to just expand because now Microsoft in their newest version of Windows 10 has Cortana. So voice control is going to be a big thing in the Internet of Things. And this is, next part, just talk about some of the hardware that's out there that is being used in the Internet of Things. So call it this page. And a lot of this hardware is you can purchase yourself. So it's something that you can go out there today and play with on your own. So right here are some of the small devices that are out there. Uh, the pan stamps. This is a, what they call an Arduino compatible device. Arduino is an open source hardware platform that has just exploded in the what they call the maker and the internet of uh, things area. So these are little controllers that you can use and they're relatively cheap. Like this one right here is only eight, you know, $18. And then you, know, you can hook up different sensors to it and program it to uh, relay data to either Wi-Fi or even Bluetooth. And again, uh, Tiny Arduino, Arduino Uno, these are just different variations. There's, Arduino has a whole family of different controllers and different sizes out there. Like this one here is a quarter size. So at that size, you can embed that in your clothing. I just scrolled down so many others. And Piccolo, this is actually a local company in Ann Arbor who uh, has designed this. Uh, little Internet of Things device. It's another, as they call Arduino compatible device. This one uses more of a low power radio. So you can now control this device and monitor it at a distance. A lot of your other devices may need a Ethernet or you may have to add another board to it, which this can actually be plugged into an Arduino. So you want to set up a remote sensor to sense, uh, like I said, pollution. So, you know, usually you would think, well, I'd run an Ethernet cable. Well, cables are great if you can run it and have the money and time to run those cables, but now you can do it wirelessly. So basically, you set little wireless points. And then also, with the technology, you can, as they call, mesh these wireless so they all are interconnected with each other. And so, you know, it's just a lot of wild things that can be done with these devices. And one of the devices we've talked about here at uh, BDPA was the, is the Raspberry Pi. It's a uh, 30, well actually I think it's even down now, but it's a $35 computer, full blown computer, uh, quad core system and one gig of memory. So it's a, it's a platform you can use to develop your Internet of Things and devices cheap. So instead of using your $2,000 laptop, now you use a $35 device. If you burn it up, okay, just buy another one. You burn up your laptop, you're going to be crying. <laughs> <laughs> and what's nice about a lot of these devices, especially Arduino and Raspberry Pi, if you just Google those devices, 
ton of help is out there, a lot of projects out there already people have made, so you can go out there, play with those projects, and learn on your own of, and how to maybe say, okay, I've learned this, this, and this, what if I combine this together? Or, what, okay, I, I don't want to program it, oh, I'll look this up, you can get example code. So th th this uh, environment, development environment out there is rich right now in information. And basically, if you just had the time, it's it, almost anyone can learn if that if you want to, because it's not really that difficult. Because these devices, when you think of it, you're not doing a hundred different operations. You're doing okay, sense this temperature, do this, do that. So you're doing it a small subset of uh, data collection, and then usually your your hard part is okay. Once you get the data. How do you massage that? And just, just a few minutes. I mean, just show just the multitude of devices that are just out there that you. And a lot of these devices are can play with them. You know, you can interconnect themselves, or even if you can't, you can still connect them through an internet or Wi-Fi connection. And like I said most devices are relatively cheap. They're usually, you know, the a couple of these are close to 200, and those are usually more for the higher end developers. So that's. And I'll also post this on the website so you can look at this link and, and go there, because this, this website I found has a lot of information on the Internet of Things. And next, we're going to talk about the software, which it, it's mind-boggling what's available that you can develop with and what what they call protocols, different software is available to use on these platforms. Now many people have heard of, okay, you can do uh, C and C++ in those languages. That's still available, but then Here are some of the, what they call embedded operating systems that you can use in these uh, small devices. And there's just a few, this is just a small, small subset. A lot of these are Linux based. But also, as I will talk about a little bit later, Microsoft has got into the, uh, the, uh, into the uh, property now, finally. So it's definitely a, uh, in the software side, it's going to be Linux heavy because Linux kernel itself is relatively small. Because it's not a, like Windows, which is a lot of graphics, everything hooked up. Uh, Linux is just a small thing that does what you need. Then you and then you kind of bolt on what you need. If you need graphics, you need this, you need that. If you don't need it, you don't install it. And a lot of devices currently are running Linux. Everyone says, well, everything runs with Windows. Well, Windows is more of a business computer, but in the Internet of Things, if you really start disassembling it and look, you'll find that there's Linux running on it in some way, either a Linux kernel or for the web development Apache system. So this free and open, this uh, open source software, which people will say, oh, it'll never catch on. Well, it's being used today on a lot of devices. And this is some of the uh, new open source operating system, like this one here, Riot. It's designed for Internet of Things. So they're trying to come with an operating system that is, that is portable across all your devices. And uh, like I said, these are just a few that are available out there. I mean, it's a lot. All joined. This is a. This is going to be. This is going to be one that's a uh, hot topic, which I'll uh, talk about in a minute. So as you can see, on the software side, is just so much out there, and then what they call middleware software. It's like this. We've become a, everything's almost software driven today. That you still need the hardware. You'll always need the hardware, but they're making it to the point that the hardware is moldable by the software now. In the past, if you had to change something on the hardware, you had to pull the whole board, redesign it, and put in that change. Today, you make the hardware 
flexible enough that if you need to change, you just change the software. Similarly, as I was saying with uh, Tesla and their car, they, they want to do an improvement on the efficiency of the uh, battery efficiency. Usually that means they go in the car, pull the board out, reinstall it, test it, and say, okay. Now it's just, okay, test the software works, load it up, done. Now, this is the part where I talk about if you're an IT professional or in IT or even interested, how can you cash in on this Internet of Things? One is through software design. And as I mentioned, Windows 10 now includes all join. And it says here, you know, all join is an open source framework that allows devices to interoperate and enables to communicate with each other, acting as a single point of access for a smart device. So basically what this is what they've done with this open source software incorporated with Microsoft is say you have a Microsoft phone. Now with your phone, you can write an app on your phone that will talk to all devices on the network. So if your house has a connected thermostat, a connected refrigerator, toaster, door opener, television, as long as those devices have all joint framework loaded in them, it will recognize and allow you to uh, communicate with it. which is a which is definitely a big game breaker because currently you use all these devices now and you needed an app each device need a separate app to this separate app separate app so you have 20 or 30 applications to run your 20 or 30 separate devices now with all joint this is going to make it possible that now one app is able to see and control your whole Internet of Things devices locally and at the corporate level. And as you can see, with there's already a lot of big name companies involved. You got Sony, HTC, which is the phone manufacturer, Honeywell, which designs corporate uh, controllers, Qualcomm, which is the big uh, manufacturer of uh, CPUs for telephones, also. So it's one of those that is uh, it's a software app that it's open source which is amazing that Microsoft went to it but I believe they went to it because it was available they saw the power and they realized if they want Windows 10 to get adopted they need that little extra hitch to say well, if you had a Windows 10 device and your other Internet of Things devices are uh, all joint compatible it will talk to them so when you write an app you can write one app and talk to everything which makes it <clears throat> Make software development easier for developers, and if you want to design a product too, it makes it easier that you design a product with this software embedded, like your t say a TV has it in there. So now, when that TV's, because most TVs now wireless connect to internet, so now if you have a software designed to talk to that all joint software, boom! Now your television is available on your cell phone. Oh, it's it's actually a device that I can see what's happening or, or change. Currently, you would have to have an app saved as a Sony TV, you have to download a Sony app just, just to talk to a Sony TV. And also, Apple, Apple's in the uh, uh, arena also, but theirs is a more closed environment, which Apple has always been. They call theirs HomeKit, and basically allows your iOS device to control any of these HomeKit enabled devices, as they mentioned, you know, your lights, locks, thermostat, smart plugs. The disadvantage of theirs is that it's not open source and it only works with those devices that Apple has allowed to come into their environment. And we know Apple, they make good stuff, but they may not have the product you want. Or if you're designing your uh, equipment yourself, you, know, you might look at, well, do I want to go to Apple Rock or use this open source thing, which is free, no licensing, and you're guaranteed that if someone has a Windows machine at home, they can talk to it. Now, do we have time? I may can show this video. Yeah, I can show this video real quick. This one just 
we'll just go through a piece of it because if it's over an hour, we they talk about the all join uh, software system. But it's just just to give you a little taste of what the app, application development on this uh, new inclusion into Windows 10. Up. Go ahead. All right, so uh, here we are, build day one. I'm Gavin Gear. I'm Brian Rockwell, and we both work on the team in Windows that's working on all joint and working with the All Seam Alliance. We're excited today to talk to you about the work that we've been doing with the All Seam Alliance and with our partners. Just a brief note, at the end you're gonna have an opportunity to send us your feedback. I'll put this QR code up again at the end and we would really appreciate it if you take the time to submit an evaluation and give us your feedback. So about five years ago, I set out on a mission. A mission that I thought would be fairly straightforward. I wanted to build a home entertainment system that would use a single remote that would be cost effective I didn't want to spend as much on a remote control as I would on an Xbox. And it would also be easy to set up, easy to maintain, and easy to use. And being the obsessive person that I am, I set out into a binge of analysis paralysis. I researched just about every component on the market. And in the end, I got close to my goal. I used an Xbox 360 remote control. I used a surround sound system and a TV from Panasonic that both used Vieira Link to communicate with each other, and life overall was good. You know, I couldn't power down the surround sound system, and I did have to switch inputs on the remote control. And I know, Gavin, I'm not nearly as obsessive as you are, nor <laughs> as compulsive, but uh, I looked into this, same as you, uh, about the same time, but I quickly backed away from it. It just seemed it's complicated. It's expensive, really doubled up. It, the technology didn't really seem to be there. It seemed like a little bit of a wasted opportunity. Well, I also have kind of devolved into the basket of remote scenario. I decided I was going to try an Amazon Fire TV, which of course uses Bluetooth. And then I've got everything else on infrared. And in frustration, I thought to myself, how could it be 2015, you know, this day and age when we put a man on the moon, we've connected the whole world with the internet. You know, we're just on the verge of being able to 3D print replacement body parts. And it still takes me three remote controls to watch TV. You know, there's just so much potential for all these scenarios of interoperability and all these devices working together. This area is just exploding. Uh, so many new devices are being created each day. And the opportunity is definitely profound. The IDC is predicting in the next five years, we're going to have 28 billion connected devices. That's four connected devices for every man, woman, and child on the face of the earth. But where there's huge opportunities, there's also huge challenges. This example here is just you know, the end result of some of those challenges. What we're here today to talk about is all seen and all join. This is a technology that was created to address some of these huge challenges and to help remove some of these huge barriers. Being developers, we want to give you guys and you all a sort of all join one-on-one -on -one so that you can understand what all join is, what the different platform components are, how they work, and then how you can actually bring them into Windows. So we've spent some time in the past year bringing all join into Windows want to explore some of the reasons why we did this, some of the benefits that this gives us, as well as get you guys up to speed so you can go out and make the next great Internet of Things app. We'll tell you how to get involved with the Austin Alliance, move forward, potentially contribute your code back, and help drive the future of IoT. So that's, in, in general, what we're going to talk about. Quick question, who here has heard of the Austin Alliance and knows what the Austin Alliance is? Wow, that's pretty impressive. So, the All Seen Alliance is basically the organization, the organization that is a consortium of hundreds of companies that have come together to help evolve the future of the Internet of Things. It's run by the Linux Foundation. It uses some of the people and the resources and the structure from the Linux Foundation. But really, All Seen Alliance 
is the organization. All join is the result of the collaboration between these companies. It's actually the code base and the source. It's an open source and cross platform. Any developer can use it to enable their apps and their devices to be internet connected. So the, the example that I gave of my home entertainment system was really just a small view into a much larger problem domain, the problem domain of the smart connected home. Yeah, the technology to connect these different devices has already existed for many, many years. But a lot of them are trapped within uh, concrete verticals in their walled gardens. It's either within an iOS or an OS, within a uh, manufacturer schema, but they're all locked down and they're hard to access. And viewing this from an app developer's perspective, there's really a lot of surface area. You know, you've got different protocols, different APIs, a lot of different scenarios to provide support for in your application, and it's a moving target. You but that's just a piece of that uh, presentation. But as you can see, just what they're talking about is that's what this software, all join, is going to allow. And that's something that if you're looking to make money, it's somewhere to, something to learn. And as you saw, it has Linux embedded in there, so it's, you, you get into a uh, Linux environment and a Windows environment. Now on the hardware side, like I said earlier, uh, I explained that you can use the Arduino or Raspberry Pi, and this would be your development platforms that you can uh, play with to create Internet of Things devices. Both of these devices have their plus and minuses on what you want to do. The Arduino is more for once you've, uh, to do more single task items. So you want to collect temperature data or some other pressure data. It's more of what they call a, a digital controller. So it's not as fast as a, a Raspberry Pi, but for the type of information you're collecting, it's, it's uh, quick enough for most of your uh, needs. And the Raspberry Pi, again, low cost, but this was a little more robust platform with a Linux operating system. And also Windows 10, as of course Microsoft got in, you can load what they call a Windows 10 core on the Raspberry Pi, which gives you some of the, a lot of functionality in Windows 10 but more for the Internet of Things device. So it's going to have that all join framework built in and a few other, uh, a few other uh, uh, services available that allow you to use the Raspberry, integrate the Raspberry Pi into uh, a Windows environment. And I just right here, which I'll post, there's a couple of websites you can go to that have tutorials on how to use each device. And if you just go to YouTube and just Google Arduino Raspberry Pi, you'll find a ton of information on how to use it, how to set it up, projects people have built, so you can actually build those projects yourself and learn from, from that, and then maybe you know, dissect it, reverse engineer it, and say, okay, here's what they did, what else can I do with these uh, devices? So even, even though you're thinking IT software, but there's a hardware side too, because you're going to have to learn how to integrate the hardware and then have the software talk to that integration. Uh, another area out there to cash in is security. Now we've, we've all heard about the big security breach at the U.S. government. Mm -hmm. And these Internet of Things devices, now you got to think of, ooh, now I've got my house connected on the Internet. And I have my door locks possibly connected on the internet. So security is going to be a very, very large concern. You know, at the application level, the big one that has been already discussed was on the webcam and baby monitors. People who set up their security cameras and baby monitors, a lot of those developers didn't put security in mind. So basically with the internet, you can surf and find people's cameras. So you can now look, oh, no one's home. Oh, okay, that's a good target. <laughs> or the baby monitors, oh, if somebody with nefarious will know where your kids are. And, and that's just, that's just a small sample. Let's even think of your, 
your connected watches now. Let's say if now those devices connect to your health record, which eventually they would love to do. Currently they're not, but that's something that could happen. And there's going to be uh, some security concerns on that. So as an IT pro, learning how to uh, negate a lot of those securities could be a money maker. And one way, uh, in the firmware level, this is actually at the level of the hardware, because all hardware devices have called, has what they call firmware, which operates the hardware itself. And a lot of companies aren't looking at the software vulnerabilities in their firmware. That I've talked to a security professional, he's actually called up a couple of companies and said, well, you know, yeah, your app is nice and tight, but your firmware, I can go in and still access the device. So that's an uh, area where you could uh, use your security uh, uh, knowledge, test people's devices and find out, is there a way to get into it? Yeah, that's probably about years ago, there were people who had like, certain companies, they had set up they had security blocks on actual desktop computers themselves. Because mm -hmm. you had a computer all nice and locked down, however, would stop somebody that has too much time in their hands at work to go in there and pull a hard drive out, put another hard drive in, do what they want to do with computers. Even though you'll never see anyone federal government do that. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, so when you think of security, this is going to be a, a uh, big, big issue because uh, now, like I said, you've got the electric company who's trying to get involved in your house, and soon the water company, and so it's like, those are, that's, that's vulnerabilities. They can, they can either take control of your house or, let's say, divert the billing or something. Next thing you know, your your water bills triple. Like, but hold it, I haven't I, I haven't done anything. Someone's may have hacked in and added their bill to your bill, so they're getting free water, free electricity. And another aspect is cloud computing. Everyone's heard about that. Everything you know, can, everything connects to the cloud. But another uh, application, of course, you have the cloud. Now there's fog computing. And fog computing, as its definition is saying, it's more of distributed computing brought down closer to the device. So this is going to be more for your corporate type of applications that instead of sending everything to the cloud, they may have local processors that handle that data before it's sent to the cloud. And as it, as it mentioned too, a lot of this is occurring because of security compliance. That you just don't want to go directly to the cloud first, maybe you want to locally massage that data and make sure you've uh, pulled out any personal identifiable information that's not really necessary to be sent. Because currently now a lot of these Internet of Things devices, whatever information it gets just pushes all up to the cloud. And is it really necessary? No, it's just how the software was designed. It just grabbed all the data and just pushed it and cared. But now companies have realized uh, that's not good because now you're exposing your consumer data out there to whoever can uh, figure out to tap into that uh, data. So let me see anything else I want to talk about there. Is there cloud, fog computing? Oh, yeah, another aspect too that as an IT pro. As you've heard of, we've run out of IP addresses. Well, that's what the old scheme, what they call IP version 4. IP version 6 is out there. And that's going to be a challenge to help uh, integrate that into mainstream uh, systems. So there's an avenue that IT Pro can get into is to learn IP6, how it operates, how you uh, set up your network using IP6, how you implement IP6 on uh, a lot of your devices. Because currently there's not a, there's, there's a uh, kind of a uh, desert right now, people who really are into IP6 because they've delayed it so long because we should have been switched over to IP6 many years ago, but they found little tricks and things to keep IP4 going, but with the internet of things, that's not going to work because there, it, as I said, six billion devices. Uh, IP4 can only handle four billion addresses. 
And in the th with IP6, the number of devices you can handle is enormous. Basically, let's say that you can give every atom on this planet an IP6 address, and you still haven't run out. So that's how big of an address space IP6 is. So they definitely need professionals who know how to use it, how to properly segment it out, and for your device to uh, communicate properly over that protocol. So that kind of ends the presentation on Internet of Things. So just to give you a nice overview, a little bit of tech, but overview of what's happening because it's just going to grow. It's going to expand and grow daily. You know, you're going to hear more and more devices that at first you're not going to realize, but then you look, oh, that is in the things device. It is sensing. It is collecting data. It is connected to a network. So any uh, questions or comments? Well, thank you very much. And uh, if you have any questions, I, I will post this on the internet on our website. Oh, I'll get it next week. Post it so you can download and look at it. I just have one question. Mm -hmm. When when then when is all this gonna take effect or is there is you know it's being phased in mm -hmm. I guess now, but it's already taking effect. It's just yeah. that it's a an adoption is slower because like I uh, mentioned, IP six has to be implemented fully. Because if I in it if I IP six protocol, you're not gonna be able to get those devices to talk properly. And currently they're using the old scheme and it's working now, but if let's say if Apple now sells a billion iWatches, uh, they're going to have some issues. But I have talked to some of the developers, those Apple has thought ahead and I think they have IP6 kind of ready in these devices, so if they have to, they can switch over, but then all the applications have to be changed too. So you have to adjust. That's a, and that's a little market too that you make it go in and maybe you're not a developer, maybe you're someone who can say, I can take an app and convert it from IP4 to IP6 and, and allow your device to work. So that, that's a, you know, it's one of those entrepreneurial things you can think about like, oh, that's right, if I'm good with IP6, you can sell that skill to companies say, yes, I know how to do it. I can help consult your developers on how to get the software to work properly. And like it was mentioned, smart cities, all major cities are eventually going to implement that technology smart of uh, Internet of Things into the city. Embedding devices in the road. Uh, I think Ann Arbor and Detroit, we've had a couple of uh, tests for uh, embedding devices for uh, traffic control. And also for the, you know, the embedding it for the driverless cars. So it's happening. It's slow right now because they don't want to rush into it. Because right now, like as they were mentioning, the, the current trend devices are all talking to one app at a time. Now they want to interconnect that into the network, so that makes it easier to handle. But now you've got, you know, if you're the big data, the new word is now huge data. Because now the Internet of Things is coming online. Now you get even more of this information flooding the systems. And, Again, that's an opportunity for someone to go, on, okay, how do you handle this data? Because our current database, some of our current database can handle temperature data, it's a lot of the number stuff is easy, but now you're talking about video, sound, and some other information coming in. How do you massage that and use it, uh, use it effectively? Because I said, even Detroit, the traits, uh, we we're test beds for a lot of that. Like, so we've had uh, a couple of those tests for the uh, cars. Our bus system, they definitely want to get that going so you can uh, track the bus. Like I said, Uber's already using it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and it's going to just grow. So now your iWatch can go and call your car or whatever and tell you where it's at. Or it looks at your schedule and goes, oh, OK. You're at this point, I'll have a Uber car ready for you based on your schedule and call it automatically. You don't even have to. So for a businessman, okay, I got to schedule this, boom, boom, sets up his uh, 
software. So his watch and his phone talk to each other. Okay, you're done with me. Give him ten minutes. You know, lift his, your ride to be out there. <laughs> or if you even track it, I've heard people because of the bike theft is starting to go up. People have embedded trackers in their bicycle and other devices so you can actually track what's happening with your bike. But don't go after the person. I just heard it's on the news. It was in England. They, they were tracking their phone, found the people, but the people were very bad people. <laughs> well, I guess uh, that calls it a day for the presentation. We have a uh, some refreshments in the back, so go ahead and grab something. Uh, BDPA during the summer, we're kind of shut down. This is our last uh, big event until uh, September. But uh, if you're interested, we have our national convention coming up in August. That's uh, August 18th or 16th? Yes, 16th. 17th. 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 It's going to be here in Detroit? No, uh, DC. Oh. We're going to bring you to Detroit maybe yeah. in a couple of years. In a couple of years. So who's in Detroit when? 05. I always listen to 05. 05. It was in Detroit. So. so we may, we're looking to hopefully by then the M1 ran, all that stuff is built, so that could yeah. make it a lot <laughs> oh, more convenient. Yeah, right. yeah. And speaking of M1 Rail, they're talking about internet things on that, that the cars there will have internet access. Mm. And I'm not, and they may even have tracking systems so you can. Add that to your phone to know when, it, when it's coming up to your stop. Yeah, so, because eventually, should that go all the way to Ann Arbor? I mean, we don't know. Yes. Yeah, what's, yeah. what's the purpose? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's right around the town? Or? Yeah, it's, well, right now, I call it the Dan Gilbert Express. It basically yeah. takes you to Dan Gilbert's properties. Yeah, that's basically <laughs> you know, that's, that's really what's We really today. need that. So just take your route uh, just up and down Woodward to See, you know, Midtown and his, and his properties. And of course, when Red Wing Stadium is built. I thought it would go further out. It's supposed to. They Not got initially. Problems. Yeah, initially it was supposed to. They cut it back. Now there's money. Like oh, we yeah. remember we had a uh, oh, yeah. we yeah. had a uh, presentation here from someone from the M1 Rail earlier oh, this huh. year. There's money, but the matching money is not enough for people. Mm -hmm. I think it's a few million, but to do rail, it costs you 10 times that amount that they're offering you. Mm -hmm.